Great. Ted, if you could begin by telling me your full name and a little bit about your, your life story. Yes, well, I, I was born in 1920, and um, Edwin Hunt, um, one of four children. My father was a, a lighterman, that is, he worked on the River Thames for, with tugs and barges. And in fact, the family had been doing that for some, what, nearly 300 years, yes. So, um, I always wanted to work on the river. And uh, when I was 15, left school, became apprentice and worked afloat, started off as a boat boy. I was very, very fortunate in that I in those days, it was quite common, an everyday thing, for barges to be rowed. You know, big 50-ton barges were rowed by one man. Anything between 50 tons carrying capacity and 150 had to have one man, one licensed man, and another, and of course the other was always the apprentice. So I learned to do that. But I was especially fortunate because the firm I worked for was the last firm to engage in the practice of towing those barges, 150 ton barges, with a rowing boat. And I became the boat boy. Um, I would have a man join me, and there would be two men on the barge required by law, and uh, we, we would tow it, you know, and uh, you take a stroke and the, the rope pulls up and then it um, contracts and you're going backwards and, oh, you have muscles on your muscles. So can you tell me, Ted, uh, when and why you joined up? Well, I, w I was uh, a fifth year apprentice uh, in my fifth year um, when the war started. So. Um, I joined up and I joined the Royal Engineers as a sapper waterman, half a crown a day, equivalent to what's called now pence these days. Um, and I was immediately sent to a field company, well, went to Chatham, Kitchener Barrett's Chatham, then to the 229 Field Company, who were a territorial unit in the 49th West Riding Division, hence the uh, the White Roses. Because battle dress was in short supply and it was a territorial unit, the quartermaster had service dress, bra you know, brass buttons, cheese cutter hats, and at the top of the sleeve, on each sleeve, was a, a white rose. So I, I had one of these for some three months and eventually, before going overseas, I was issued with proper battle dress. Um, and when I had to hand my service dress in, much regret, I looked very, very smart, I removed the white roses and uh, um, I gave one away to another sapper who uh, was also in the 49th Division and had a cloth one, so uh, he envied these and so um, I didn't mind giving up one. What was your training like? Well, we did the normal basic training. It was, as I remember it in those days, Manual of Field Engineering Volume 2 was the, was the Bible. It was a green thing. And it was blocks and tackles and use of spars and all kinds of things. Because for me, we were up in Yorkshire at um, a place just outside Ripon, uh, Cock Hewick. And we came down to Wallingford for a fortnight's pontoon training, just upstream of Wallingford Bridge. Now, the territorial unit people, they'd been to Scarborough and done their summer's camp, but they weren't really expert oarsmen. And rowing on a pontoon with your legs out straight is rather difficult, it, you know, you feel it uh, behind the knees. And the river had been in flood and had flooded the flood plain, the grass on either side, and had just dropped sufficiently to, to come back to its normal summer banks. And so was, it was at its fastest. Um, someone who rode for College 8 up there has uh, since told me that it was about four knots. That's, that's, that's pretty fast. And so there are, our pontoon rafts had to be built, constructed upstream, and by the time they rode across, they travel quite a bit downstream to the, the bridging site. And the difficulties came when we came to dismantle the bridge. And uh, 
someone eventually found out that uh, there was a, a waterman in the company, Sapper Hunt. We were supposed to have four, but there were, I was the only one. And um, one of these rafts actually went down through uh, Wallingford Bridge, uh, luckily without mishap. Um, and so I was asked, how would you bring the last raft back? Because the last one has got to bring the half floating bay. And that instead of having, I think, eight rowers, there's only room for six. So I said, having carried out, gone to work with my father when I was a schoolboy, he, he, as a lighterman, his job was each day to bring the loaded barges ashore, empty bar uh, sorry, rather, loaded barges. He worked for Tate and Lyles at Plaster Wharf, um, just above Willage. And these loaded barges, 200 tonnes of sugar would be moored up at the boys off the float. And when the tide came in, he would bring them ashore to, to be offloaded and the sugar would go in for refining. So he became an expert in shearing barges ashore. Now, there's a great art and people um, don't know that it is done. What happens is, if you hold the barge at an angle by tying the rope up on, shall we say, on one side of the barge, a little bit back from four foot right forward, then it is held at an angle to the stream. And in the same way that a kite will shear upwards in and overcome the force of gravity, a barge can be made to go sideways. Now, the, if the rope, the rope really then becomes the, the radius of a circle and the barge travels along the circumference, actually going upstream. So with, with a three knot tide running on the ebb, uh, this barge is traveling across on its way towards the, the berths where it will be discharged. And there, my, I learned from my father that the art in shearing is knowing exactly when to let go. And you wait for, just begin, she begins to turn. At that moment, there's a, a vortex, a, there's a bit of a hole in the water on the lee bow. And uh, that straightens her up and she shoots in ashore. And well, I did this with um, the raft, and because it was the last one, you can imagine there were about 120 men ashore waiting to see uh, the last one because they expected us to go down through the bridge. But um, having a, a, any rope that you like, have any length in from the stores, field park pickets driven into the bank. I had a um, um, Jersey fisherman who knew how to handle an oar, um, standing right aft, and away she went. I tucked the bite underneath the fender, which is like the handle on the pontoon, and you can imagine being sort of a catamaran, you've got two bearing surfaces, sheared beautifully. It was like a, a box kite. And of course she came towards midstream, climbed upstream, let go, fell alongside, and she finished up opposite where she started. Now, my mates afterwards said, well, it's impossible. No one rowed. Of course, the six men were still sitting there, oars in the upright position. Now, our RSM had been posted to the company about a week before, and he saw this performance, and he was very, very impressed because he hadn't seen it done before. Um, uh, that was just before Christmas, Christmas leave in January. I was one of the sappers put on a cadre course uh, for my Lance Corporal Strike. We were prepared to go, um, we actually we went to Norway as part of the Northwestern Expeditionary Force, NWEF. Now, it's not widely known, but it's no secret. There is a book called Narvik where the truth is there for all to read. Um, the intention of War Office was that we would invade Norway to capture the ice-free port of Narvik. Norway, new, Norway was neutral because the Baltic was frozen up and all the Swedish iron ore uh, went on a railway line through the mountains and finished up at Narvik, which was an ice-free port warmed by the Gulf Stream. 
So um, we wanted to ensure that we had a good supply of um, iron ore for the rest of the war, and the Germans had the same idea. Now we know that they knew that we were going, and um, they got there first. So I was actually on, on a boat, a Polish troop ship called Batory, on the 6th of April, knowing that, that I was one of those about to invade Norway. And we were in Scapaflow on the 9th, when we heard on the radio that uh, the Germans had marched in ahead of us. It took about four days to get across, zigzagging. We landed at, on the island of Hinoy at a place called Hofstad. Uh, there were Scots guards and, and um, Irish guards there. We were in good company. And eventually we went to a little hamlet about 19 miles from Narvik, the place called Evanskaya. And our job, snow cover of course, it was very, very cold. Instead of doing two hours on the sentry and four hours off, you did um, 10 minutes on and uh, 20 minutes off. So you had no sleep at night. Um, our Arctic gear was first class. I understand that it had originally been made because there was uh, an intention for us to go to the aid of the Finns when it was attacked by Russia. But luckily uh, uh, that did not happen. So the Arctic, Arctic gear was very good. Now our job at Evansjaya was to turn 14 separate fields that were covered in snow into one long one to make an airstrip for fighter, fighter planes to land. Uh, and this is what we did. We um, had Norwegian horses and sledges and we got rid of the snow. But more importantly, these 14 fields were separated by uh, ditches to drain the, the melting water down into the fjord and we made box drains of wood, wooden boxes, uh, which all joined together and filled the ditch in so we made 14 fields into one. Now this took four weeks actually. During that time our ACAC defence was um, one of two anti-aircraft cruisers that we had in the Navy at the time, the Coventry and the Curlew. So the Coventry was our ACAC defence for a fortnight. And each day, I it's fair to say every day, on three or four occasions during the day, a Messerschmitt 110, twin engine German fighter bomber, would come over the, the fjords, which were you know, over the mountains on the other side of the fjord, dive down and drop three bombs and miss. And in all the rounds that went up, heavy stuff, then pom-pom, then light machine gun fire, they never brought a plane down. And Coventry withstood this for two weeks, and then her place was taken over by the Curlew. And she lasted two weeks, but on the last day, of, on the day we actually we finished building the airstrip, and about three hours before the Hurricanes arrived, uh, the curlew was hit with a loss of 40 men, but they did get her ashore and everyone else came ashore. One of our sappers actually had a camera and I had a photograph of her with her head up on the shore and uh, a wash aft. Um, she was only there for three or four hours, I think, and slid off and turned over and disappeared. I met a lighterman some years after and he'd lost his son on the curlew so I passed the photograph on to him. I was able to say half past six on Sunday the, the 26th of May the curlew was lost at that place. And I've had a look at a recent map of Norway and I think there's still a landing strip there so they've made good use of it. Um, so that was that's that's how we spent our time.